In truth, if you look at over a long enough time horizon, everyone will ultimately likely develop atherosclerosis or plaque in their coronary arteries at some time point. The mm. key is we develop a small amount as late as possible that ultimately doesn't cause a complication leading to an event. Heart disease doesn't kill people. Heart attacks kill people. Welcome to the Seamland Podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Patty Barrett. Dr. Paddy is a preventive cardiologist from Ireland. He's got 20 years of experience in preventing heart disease and improving metabolic health. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, my favorite company for blue blocking glasses, red light therapy devices, and red light light bulbs. These items are essential for keeping your sleep wake on the cycles aligned in a world that tries to mess them up. Instead of looking at your phone before bed and letting the blue light disrupt your melatonin production, why not wear blue blockers instead that prevent that from happening? Instead of having your bedroom lit up with bright lights, use the more sleep friendly alternative by opting for flicker free red light light bulbs that don't disrupt your sleep. Bond Charge also has amazing infrared sauna blankets that can give you the same health benefits as the traditional sauna. You also get the unique benefits of infrared light that improves joint and skin health. Head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamland and use the code SEAM, S-I-I-M, for a 15% discount. Dr. Patty, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm uh, excited to have you on the show and uh, we're going to talk about uh, heart disease which uh, is still the number one killer in the developed countries, the number one cause of death worldwide. So um, yeah, maybe you as a cardiologist, maybe we can start with some, I guess, like some statistics, like what is the situation with heart disease right now? Like, is it still the number one killer? And yeah, how are we seeing any improvements in the statistics or uh, not? So I think it's always important to put things in context. Uh, the way I approach things is, uh, you know, stats and actuarial models. Um, if you look globally, as you said, uh, heart disease is the leading cause of death. And I think roughly kills about 20 million people um, uh, each year. And that is actually probably close to double um, what cancer kills on uh, an annual basis. And that's on a global basis. The, the differences in terms of mortality, in terms of uh, global figures, and also in the developed nations is actually much closer. And often you get this uh, on par kind of one, two jockeying for position in terms of all cardiovascular disease. So heart disease, uh, stroke, peripheral arterial disease, and with all cancers. Um, what is really important to point out is although it is a leading cause of death, if you look at the differences in terms of mortality at an earlier time point compared to, say, 50 years ago, it has decreased considerably. Um, now, those differences have been manifest across uh, different socioeconomic classes um, more dramatically. So if you're in a lower socioeconomic class, you haven't accrued the same amount of benefits. The second thing is, is that those continued declines really started to plateau out around 2010 and have slowly started to tick back up a little bit. Um, but in the context of where we were compared to 50 years ago or the 1950s, there has been an absolute uh, implosion in terms of the annual death rates at an earlier time point. Mm, well, what is like? what was the biggest reason why there was such a drastic decrease in heart disease? It's multifactorial, but there is no doubt that you can overlay quite clearly the decreased rates in smoking um, as mm. probably one of the biggest drivers in terms of early heart disease presentations, fatal myocardial infarctions. Um, so, you know, in terms of <clears throat> it's even it's even different uh, in terms of the last 10 to 15 years in terms of how people would present. Um, people obviously still have very serious heart attacks, fatal heart attacks, but you can see a pattern that has, has changed over the years. People tend to present with um, less what are called STEMIs or an acute occlusion uh, of the vessel and more non-STEMIs, so subacute occlusions. Um, they tend to present earlier. They tend to present with less mechanical complications. And when you look at the, I suppose, the environmental factors as well, people are, are much more dialed into the cardiovascular risk factor profile, how to manage it and how to potentially kind of delay the onset of mm. cardiovascular disease. So, while I think on a on a ranked basis that cardiovascular disease still requires a huge amount of our attention, and we have to always look at it on the basis as a leading cause of death, where eighty to ninety percent of it in its early form is preventable, we always have to hold it in comparison to the unbelievable progress that has been made over the last fifty years. 
Mm, yeah, if you, I mean, I think it's hard to like you know picture it, but if I think I think we can overlay some graphs as well that you know it's pretty steep decline <laughs> if you look at the graph since the fifties uh, with the heart disease uh, deaths. Uh, but uh, you know, you mentioned that smoking was the biggest thing responsible for that, probably. But at the same time, we've seen that you know obesity and diabetes and those things have still kept climbing quite a lot, especially in the, like the United States and even like you know UK and uh, Europe. The obesity rates are higher than ever before. So uh, yeah, like how big of a role does obesity then play in heart disease? So it, it plays a huge role, um, and I think that uh, obesity. And when we talk about obesity, really, what we're talking about is is excess weight that is driving a health consequence or metabolic dysfunction. Um, and so historically, we would have talked about, say, BMIs, and they're roughly uh, a kind of you know for population level statistics, a good descriptor of, of of likelihood of having metabolic health. But they have a lot of kind of nuance to them. And also we have better markers in terms of defining, I suppose, the risk that comes with um, with excess weight now. Um, but I think in terms of when you're talking about acute plaque ruptures, um, pretty much there's nothing that compares with smoking. Um, and I think it's, it's if you look at the time course um, of, you know, when someone smokes and the, the time point that they get disease, in general, it's going to be much, much earlier um, with with smoking. Um, I think the, the analogy that I often use for the development of atherosclerosis is that if you take a cholesterol particle and you basically throw it through a glass window, um, when it gets lodged on the far side, that is when a cholesterol particle has become retained in the artery wall. And that is the, you know, the, the, the cardinal definition or synchronon of atherosclerosis. Um, if you have, you know, increased ApoB levels or uh, LDL particle counts, you're throwing more particles. Um, if you have high blood pressure, you're throwing them harder. If you have diabetes, you're throwing golf balls and tennis balls. If you have an elevated LP little A, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about at some point, you're throwing cricket balls as well. But if you're mm. a smoker, you've effectively walked over to that pane of glass with a hammer, smashed it, and everything is just flying right through. So, you know, I think the the obesity epidemic and all the metabolic dysfunction that is driving is, is really amplifying all those risk factors. Um, and is certainly at a population level making a huge difference to a whole variety of different conditions. But if you look at the the sudden acute impact that smoking makes, it's mm. it's just unparalleled in terms of the disease risk for for cardiovascular disease. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like there is almost like tiers of imp like effect on heart disease. Some things are yeah like much worse uh, for for the risk like you know smoking as you mentioned. And yeah, uh, it would be interesting to know like. You know, with at least uh, a lot of smoking has a lot of like these appetite suppressing effects as well that might prevent some people from becoming overweight. And like once they stop smoking, they might have started gaining weight. So that it's kind of a trade off. Like maybe smoking is still, yeah, <laughs> worse as it looks. I, I, yeah. And, and I think everything, you know, as, as Thomas Sowell, the American philosopher, famously said, there are no solutions, there are only trade offs. Um, mm. But when you're making trade offs, you have to be very clear about what your goal is and how the equation balances on each side. Um, you know, we know that in terms of weight loss therapeutics, um, there have been very effective weight loss therapeutics going back over 100 years. Um, one of the most famous ones, and I can't remember the exact chemical compound, but it was basically noted as a byproduct of people working in the munitions factories in World War I, um, that they were losing significant amounts of weight. Um, the problem was, was that loads of them were dying um, mm. as a consequence. So it's like, yeah, really effective yeah. weight loss tool, but not exactly a great longevity uh, strategy. Um, yeah. And, you know, in terms of, it's funny that the conversation around smoking um, for, for most people interested in this particular area has fallen away. It's rare that we actually talk about smoking because if your objective and your goal is is longevity, it's it's rare that you come across someone who is a smoker. And when you look into the statistics around smoking, you find some some just amazing, amazing descriptive statistics. In the US, more people have died from smoking-related illnesses than all of the wars they have fought combined. 
Um, there's a very famous quotation and statistic by um, Scott, I think it's Gottlieb, who was a previous FDA commissioner, who said that smoking is the only legally available product that will kill 50% of its users. Mm. Um, so it's 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 funny in terms of it, it, it's just an area that we don't typically touch upon very commonly because it is just so clear that it carries such incremental risk across so many different disease states, uh, but particularly cardiovascular disease. Mm, yeah, right. I think it was. I think that fat loss uh, molecule was DMP, if I'm not mistaken. Like, yeah, that's, I think that's it, what some of the bodybuilders, like that, yeah. some of the bodybuilders, used to use to lose a lot of weight uh, in the past. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe we can take a step back as well and uh, talk about like what is heart disease overall. So you mentioned a few concepts like atherosclerosis and uh, the lipid particles. So uh, yeah, maybe we can discuss. You know, there's different types of heart diseases, uh, cardiovascular diseases. So, what is the umbrella term, and what are the like subgroups, and how do they uh, manifest? Yeah, so I think it's really important that people get these categories uh, correct because there's certain assumptions that are made and that we we skip over. But it's it's really important that we clarify them. When someone says heart disease. Heart disease is not a disease. It is, as you said, an umbrella category for all the conditions that typically uh, involve the cardiovascular system. So if we talk about severe mitral regurgitation, which is a leaking of a valve, that is heart disease. Um, but when we talk about uh, heart disease, and if you look at the actual deaths that are associated with it, 90% of those will come from basically atherosclerosis, which is the accumulation of plaque in the artery wall. The deaths will be primarily from coronary artery disease. So when that process forms in the coronary or heart arteries, and a smaller percentage will be cerebrovascular disease. So deaths from stroke. So really, when we're talking about cardiovascular disease, it's deaths from coronary artery disease, heart attacks, and also strokes. Now, the fundamental basis that sits uh, and, and joins the two of those uh, conditions together is atherosclerosis. Now, atherosclerosis is the you know technical term for plaque, so you can see why we call it plaque. Um, and when we think about what that is, what that is fundamentally is the abnormal retention of a cholesterol particle in the artery wall that sets off an inflammatory process. So no matter which risk factor we look at, the underlying key requirement is that a cholesterol particle has been retained abnormally in the, re the arterial wall, in the subendothelial space, and sets off an inflammatory process. All of the other factors that are involved as risk factors for atherosclerosis or coronary artery disease basically act as either accelerants or protectors for that process. So you're either speeding it up or slowing it down. And it's also important to realize that we have to make very clear distinctions in three separate categories. We have to think about risk factors. That's elevated lipid particle counts, blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, inactivity, etc. Then you have to look at their likelihood of increasing the amount of disease, which is the plaque or atherosclerosis. And the more plaque you have, the higher the risk of an event, such as a heart attack. And a kind of a general use term here is that, you know, heart disease doesn't kill people. Heart attacks kill people. And my goal for myself and, you know, for all of my patients is to die at the end of a long and healthy life, hopefully suddenly with coronary artery disease rather than from it. Because mm. in truth, you know, if you look at over a long enough time horizon, everyone will ultimately likely develop atherosclerosis or plaque in their coronary arteries or cerebrovascular vessels at some time point. The mm. key is, is that we develop a small amount as late as possible that ultimately doesn't cause a complication leading to an event. So when we're thinking about this, this whole architecture of a problem, we always have to be very clear in terms of our terminology. Are we talking about risk factors, which is increasing the probability of a disease? Are we talking about the actual disease, which is the retention of a particle? Or are we talking about an event? Mm. Um, and and th those those categories become really important in terms of how we interpret trials, how we think about assessing risk, um, and how we think about trying to reduce risk. Mm. Yeah, that's I think that's very like key insight for a lot of people. I, I would imagine that you know, like all all of us will have some aspects of atherosclerosis eventually. <laughs> if we're like over a hundred years old, we'll have something. Um, and the same with like other organs as well, just that just by virtue of aging, our organs will 
deteriorate and we'll develop some aspects of neurodegeneration and atherosclerosis and kidney disease if we get to a certain age. And I th if I'm not mistaken, then they've also also seen these uh, plaques already in like young people, in even like infants, and in, if they've done autopsies from like accidents and uh, you know teenagers as well, if if uh, they've died to like some accidents. Yeah, and uh, and that's the really kind of I think I suppose frightening aspect of this is that if you're an adult who's listening to this discussion, the probability is is that if we were to look with a microscope at your coronary arteries, there would very likely be the earlier stages of plaque buildup. And again, I think one of the the key frameworks when thinking about heart disease and heart disease prevention is that pretty much. When you start off in life, you will have no plaque in your coronary arteries. Over time, you will develop plaque in your coronary arteries. And over a long enough time horizon, you will develop likely a significant amount of plaque in your coronary arteries and likely have an event from it. The question is, is when you start accumulating plaque in your coronary arteries. Now, when we look at more advanced uh, imaging testing in terms of, say, calcium scoring, et cetera, you know, we know that by age 54, about half of males will have no advanced plaque in their coronary arteries, and the other half will have a, some advanced plaque. For females, that is pushed out to about age 67 or 68 years of age. However, as you referenced, if you look uh, with much more precision in terms of looking at the histology of artery walls, so therefore uh, the only finding that you can, the only way that you can do this is I is at an autopsy or if someone has actually had a heart transplant. And when you look at individuals who died suddenly from non-cardiovascular causes, so this is road traffic accidents, et cetera, and you actually look at the amount of, or, or if there is plaque in the coronary arteries, it is pretty frightening in terms of the percentages that we see of people in their, say, teenage years who have intimal medial thickening or early plaque accumulation. And where this was first described was actually during the Korean War, a study was done um, for soldiers who were average age 22 years of age, approximately 300 uh, soldiers who were killed in combat and had autopsies. And a very significant percentage, something like 60 to 70 percent, had some evidence of atherosclerosis. Now, one of the big criticisms of that particular uh, research study was that it was the 1950s. These were soldiers in Korea. The likelihood of people smoking, et cetera, is, is very, very high. But even in repeat studies of people who were acting as organ donors who would have died in, say, road traffic accidents, um, who would have been, you know, ostensibly healthy did have evidence of plaque accumulation in their coronary arteries. Um, not visible on anything that you would see in terms of imaging tests, but histologically, these people had early evidence of plaque accumulation. And the reason that this is, is really critical to understand is that for most people, when they start thinking about this question, they almost certainly have coronary artery disease. Whether or not you can see it on an imaging test, you the, the game is on and you are already accumulating plaque. And the fundamental goal here is that we delay the amount of plaque accumulation for as late as possible in life. So the, the, the answer to when people say, listen, when should people think about, you know, their risk factors for heart disease or preventing heart disease? The answer is always now. Mm. It's, al it's always now. It's always right now or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, and so, we, you know, the, the, the process has begun and the game is on. The question is, is how are you going to play that game? Yeah, yeah, it's like uh, most people might yeah start thinking about it, you know, <laughs> even after they have like you know their first heart attack or something, and then they start to think about these things. But uh, yeah, like you said, you should think about it already like twenty years in advance. And uh, the strategy should be to minimize the plaque accumulation with lifestyle as early as possible to uh, reduce the uh, accumulation. Yeah. And, and that is, I mean, at a population level, when we talk about prevention, the, the, the term prevention for, for cardiovascular disease is probably semantically incorrect um, because prevention means to avoid the outcome entirely. Whereas mm. when we're talking about prevention, really what we're talking about is deferment. So we're going to defer mm. the onset or push out or create a phase shift in the time of onset. We use, I mean, obviously prevention because using terminology like that doesn't uh, you know, sit as well. But right. when we talk about prevention, there's, there's three large categories. There's primordial prevention, which is changing the environment so the risk factors never appear. There's primary prevention so that we look at the risk factors that have appeared and we manage those risk factors to prevent the likelihood of disease or event. And then there's secondary prevention, which is for someone who has the disease, has had an event, we aggressively manage their risk factors to ultimately decrease the likelihood of a second event. 
And so we always have to think about, you know, are we changing our environment so the risk factors around us are unlikely to appear or at least appear as late as possible in life? And so, you know, we always have to consider those um, those three categories of prevention. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a new concept for me, the primordial environment or primordial prevention. I've heard about primary and secondary, but so like the primordial would be... How you're you're changing you, the yeah. environment around people. Um, it's going to be giving people the, you know, the incentive to to make good decisions. Um, it just makes it, you know, way less likely that you will smoke based on mm-hmm. regulations, etc. Um, the inaccess- inaccessibility of smoking is very prohibitively expensive. So, you know, you're not being exposed largely to secondhand smoke. So you're you're changing the environment around people that makes the 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 likelihood of a risk factor appearing less likely. Where we've seen this play out most dramatically is that if you look at our food environments, mm. um, the primordial prevention aspect there has has radically changed over the last 50 years. And that is where we see, I mean, if you go into any gas station or filling station and you look at the likelihood, you're hungry, and you look at the likelihood of you making a good decision, the, the decision is, is the, the likelihood is just so low. And mm-hmm. as as Robert Lustig famously famously said, when all your when all your options are bad options, you really don't have an option. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is you know it's 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 about things like cycling infrastructure, so that it just it's easier for people to use physical activity to transport themselves. Um, and so it's changing the environment to incentivize the good decisions rather than the bad decisions. Gotcha. Right. Um... But yeah, maybe we can now shift to like some of the biggest risk factors. So like we mentioned smoking and obesity and diabetes and blood pressure. So uh, we already created like a certain hierarchy for those. Are there any others that uh, are worth mentioning? Yeah. And and so, again, I always try and go back to my original model of atherosclerosis. It's the abnormal retention of a cholesterol particle in, in the artery wall. But mm-hmm. there are many other risk factors uh, that actually accelerate that process or are that are pour, pouring gasoline on the fire. Um, and when you actually look at these in, in large population studies and look at the hazard ratios, um, the ones that actually come out on top in terms of the biggest drivers of risk are actually the metabolic dysfunction factors of things like diabetes, for example. So if you compare someone who's got diabetes versus not diabetes and you follow them for a long period of time, the people in the diabetes category are about 10 times more likely mm. to develop coronary artery disease. Wow. Um, if you have metabolic syndrome, um, which is that precursor phase um, of metabolic dysfunction, you're about six times more likely. And if you have evidence of insulin resistance uh, as a combination of, say, elevated insulin levels and abnormalities that you can see on your lipid particles, you're again about six times more likely to develop coronary artery disease. So mm. w- we know fundamentally having elevated lipid uh, uh, particle count levels does actually increase your risk, but but the key is 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 putting those in combination with other risk factors. And what's what's really important to recognize is that if if you take a say a two by two factorial matrix of high ApoB, which is basically LDL particles, and evidence of insulin resistance, which is that precursor phase to to diabetes, um, and you take as the ideal scenario of having low particle counts and insulin sensitive, so low insulin levels. So you take that as our, our referent group. If you just if you keep the insulin low and you increase the ApoB particle count, your risk goes up by about 80%. So significant. But if you increase the ApoB particle count and make someone insulin resistant, that risk factor goes up by about 11 fold. Mm. So it's it's a huge force multiplier on all of these things. So in, in my view, in terms of preventing cardiovascular disease, largely comes down to minimizing the uh the ApoB particle count minimizing the insulin resistance, uh, not smoking, maintaining kind of normal blood pressure, et cetera. Mm. But, but, but they, are, they are the big primary drivers if we look at the, the risk factor exposure. And that is why the, the change in the environment, the increasing levels of obesity and all the metabolic dysfunction that goes with it um, is such a massive problem for population level uh, statistics around cardiovascular disease. Mm. Yeah. That's like so. The best ideal scenario is to have you know low lipids and low low diabetes uh, risk as well. And and so. yeah, and this is this is this is something that that I feel that I have to you know really go over again and again. There, there seems to have been a huge dichotomization between mm. it's cholesterol that causes heart disease or it's insulin yeah. resistance that causes heart disease. The answer is is that there was never a debate as to 
whether insulin resistance was a major driving factor in in heart disease. The answer is, is it's both. And if you're really serious about reducing your risk, you manage both. And to think that you would only manage one of those, i.e. you would just lower cholesterol, say, with the medication and let people do what they want and become insulin resistant, or vice versa, insofar as that you would optimize your lifestyle and improve your insulin sensitivity, but let your ApoB particle count go uh, excessively high, that's really not a good strategy either. Um, yeah. And so the, the the really serious actors, I think, in this space are very committed to optimizing uh, as two a fundamental components of it, both insulin sensitivity and lipid burden. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree that uh, it's not one or the other, it's both. <laughs> and the ideal scenario is to yeah, like, have, you know, normal metabolic health and uh, normal lipids and uh, normal blood pressure and normal uh, waist circumference and uh, body weight, all those things like that's how <laughs> that's how you achieve the lowest. And it's all also, you know, what you compare to, like you said, having a low ApoB and uh Oh, sorry, like high ApoB and no no insulin resistance. It's not, it's it's not like a massive risk, but it's still a risk compared to having uh, both high. So uh, it's always like what you compare things uh, to as well. Exactly, and and one one other thing that I would really highlight here is that we've never encountered uh, you know an adult in the living state who had no circulating ApoB particles. That's kind of as a that is kind of a, a die at birth uh, scenario. However, um, the the key thing here is is that people feel you know because of certain conversations that if they maintain insulin sensitivity to an exquisite level, which is possible primarily through lifestyle measures, that coronary artery disease or the development of atherosclerosis is not possible. And I can tell you that is 100% not true. So technically, if you could eliminate, uh, you know, your ApoB particles, it is kind of, you would end up with no atherosclerosis. Uh, You might have other problems uh, entirely if you completely eliminated them. Um, But the reality is, is even with people who are exquisitely insulin sensitive, I have several patients who run low fasting insulin levels, less than two, and they have extensive coronary artery disease. So it is a risk reduction probability, but it certainly does not guarantee that you will not get coronary artery disease. And I have many, many patients who are exquisitely sensitive and have been exquisitely insulin sensitive and have early coronary artery disease. So this, these factors that we talk about tilt the odds in your favor but but do not give guarantees. And this is where we need to think about how we kind of, you know, if we look at just risk factors and whether we look at, uh, at other components as well. And the other thing is, is that there are other factors that accelerate uh, coronary atherosclerosis. One of the, the biggest ones where you see the classic, you know, young, fit and healthy individual who has moderately elevated uh, lipid particle counts uh, and a strong early family history of heart disease is they have an elevated LP little a, which is a genetic cholesterol particle disorder. And, you know, sometimes when you evaluate those particular individuals, despite having relatively good parameters in terms of what we talked about, they have early coronary disease and by a consequence of that have a significantly increased risk of an event over say a five or 10 year time frame. Mm. Yeah, I think and you know the genetics can play a huge role here. So you know some people who have let's say elevated lipids, they might not get uh, let's say significant atherosclerosis very early and vice versa like uh, other people who um you know have normal lipids but they still get heart disease for some other reasons. So how big does yeah like genetics uh, play a role here? G- genetics is a, is is a big big factor, but there's there's a couple of things that I would say about the genetics of heart disease that's that's really important to emphasize for for people who are who are thinking about this question and they're saying listen, you know, there's a family history of heart disease in my, you know, family. People are having heart attacks at 50 years of age. The first is is to say that not all early heart disease um, is related to genetics. There's a lot of things that run in families that aren't necessarily genetic. There's a lot mm-hmm. of behavioral patterns. You know, smoking is the kind of the number one factor here. So when you talk to someone and it's like dad had a heart attack at 50, his brother had a heart attack at 50, their had a brother, their dad had a heart attack at 50, you go, mm, that's a very clear kind of early presentation of coronary artery disease. But all of them were heavy smokers since they were 14 years of age. That, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, all bets are off in that scenario. So number one, are you dealing with, you know, what is more likely to be uh, a genetic factor? The, the, the counter being, listen, dad was 50, fit and healthy, did everything right, didn't have high blood pressure, had a, a sudden fatal myocardial infarction at 50. Then you're thinking much more along a genetic axis. The second thing is 
even if there is a genetic risk factor for heart disease in your family, number the, the key is, is have you inherited that variant? And so the two most common ones will be things like familial hyperlipidemia, where someone has very high lipid particle counts, or an elevated LP little a, which is actually far more common and is present in about 10 to 20% of the population. But what is actually, I think, surprising based on recent literature is that if you look at those common variants, they explain about 35% of the genetics in terms of the, the risks of heart disease. But about 50% of the risk is actually to do with small, rare variants that present in a very small percentage of the population. So even if you do not have any of the specific gene variants or phenotypes of LP little a or familial hyperlipidemia, there can still be significant risk imposed by genetic risk, but it may be a very, very rare variant um, and that's always kind of an important factor to consider. Mm. And I suppose the last thing I would say is, even if you do have the genetic risk factor, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will get the disease or the phenotype. And there is an awful lot you can do to de-risk yourself from that perspective. If you look at uh, polygenic scores in terms of the development of coronary artery disease, and you look at people who are at high polygenic risk versus low polygenic risk, the uh, the people who actually, there are, you look at people who are high polygenic risk, and you look at the people who engage in lots of kind of uh, healthy lifestyle factors versus a limited amount of lifestyle factors, the people who engage in um, a lot of lifestyle factor optimization can reduce that risk overall by about 50%. Mm. So, you know, cardiovascular genetics is not destiny. For sure, yeah. With cholesterol and uh, ApoB, that has a pretty big uh, genetic component as well. And uh, this familial hypercholesteremia, if I'm not mistaken, then those people do have higher rates of uh, atherosclerosis as well compared to like the general population. Um, it, they, they do for, for sure. And certainly those in the, the, the monogenic categories, um, you know, where we look at kind of the three main kind of gene variants, um, the, you know, that can be heterozygous or homozygous and people who have uh, homozygous familial hyperlipidemia are, are developing, uh, extensive atherosclerosis from a very young age and even having myocardial infarctions or needing revascularization strategies like stents and bypasses, potentially even in kind of teenage or childhood years. Um, so that, that, but that, that, that homozygous variance is, is, is very, very rare and typically managed in the in the pediatric um, population. Mm. The, the key thing when we look at familial hyperlipidemia is that in, in my experience, most of the people who kind of fall into this kind of category don't have one of the single gene uh, variants. They are likely uh, developing elevated lipids from a variety of small gene variants that actually drive up their risk. And fundamentally, when we look at risk, risk is, is a function of how high has your your risk factor been and for how long? So if you look at, say, the, the classic, say, postmenopausal female who has had, you know, relatively normal lipid values most of their life, they go through menopause and then they have an increase in their ApoB particle count or LDL cholesterol, um, th they may end up with relatively high cholesterol. Um, but their exposure time, their area under the curve and how you integrate that function is actually pretty limited. So therefore their risk over the near term is quite uh, small in the near term. Now, lifetime is a, is a different discussion. But if you take someone who's got a genetic dyslipidemia um, and they've had moderate to high uh, elevated lipid particle counts for a, you know, a long time since birth, their exposure time, their cumulative exposure time, their area under the curve and the integration of that function is substantially more. And when you couple that with other factors that we talked about already that basically amplify that risk, that is when you get extensive coronary artery disease at a young age. And, you know, the, the reality is, is for most adults, male and female, their, their lipid values, their LDL cholesterol values will increase throughout midlife. That is phase shifted by, by about 10 years for fem females, typically maps onto when they go through menopause. Um, and so the, the levels that we see at this point, about, I think the, the literature will say about 60% of the variance is determined by genetic factors. Um, and then, you know, that, that really imposes a floor that actually people have in terms of where they're likely to be able to get to with with changes in their lifestyle, for example. Mm. Yeah, the area under the curve and the time exposure is another like critical concept that, you know, it doesn't matter if your cholesterol or, or your blood sugar or something is high for a year, relatively speaking, of course, it's not ideal. But yeah, like it matters. It, it, the effects will mostly appear over the course of decades, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. And it's like smoking as well, you know, this concept of pack smoking, the more you smoke and the longer you smoke, the higher your risk of, you know, 
cancer and heart disease is going to be as well. Like smoking for one year, relatively speaking, isn't that big compared to yeah, smoking 10 years or more. Exactly. I mean, I mean, obviously there is there are edge cases to this. Um, say when we think about like blood pressure, if suddenly you were to have a blood pressure of 250 on, you know, 150, that will pose a very significant risk in terms of near-term risk of stroke. You, you know, you may actually have a, you know, a stroke in the very near term. But if I was to, you know, change your your ApoB particle count from less than the fifth percentile to above the 95th percentile for a short period of time, th- th- you know, y- your your risk accumulation is happening faster. But the probability of you having an event as a consequence of that over the over the short term is quite low. Um, and so it's this is where I think when people are thinking about evaluating their cardiovascular risk, having access to historical data uh, over time really gives you the opportunity to build out that model. And as you had mentioned, for for you know, forever, we've been talking about smoking pack years. So it's that cumulative function of how high for how long. And more and more, we're thinking about that in terms of pack year equivalents for, you know, hypertensive exposure, for lipid exposure, for insulin resistance exposure. So it is it is the function of those two particular variables, um, which I think should offer some hope to people who may have had a short-term deterioration in, say, health metrics where things suddenly start to deteriorate, that th- this hasn't been an issue for their entire life. This is a, mm. a short change over kind of a brief period of time that hopefully with, you know, the correct measures, they can be corrected quite quickly and then to minimize their risk. Mm, yeah. So, But how high is high? <laughs> so uh, with uh, lipids, is there any threshold that is considered uh, high? And uh, what are the levels of these people who have genetically very high levels? And also, like, as I understand them, people who have genetically very low levels of these lipids have a lower rate of atherosclerosis. So what's like, what's considered like low and this is like very safe level? So in general, I tend not to describe lipid values as low or high. I think of them as a continuous distribution. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think about it as how fast are you going? Um, And if we look at those people that you're referring to have particular gene mutations around the PCSK9 gene mutation, um, that basically those individuals typically run uh, lipid values at, say, less than the fifth percentile. So kind of an ApoB concentration of less than, you know, 0.6 or 0.54, or they're running LDL concentrations down in kind of the mid to low one uh, factors or kind of 55 in in US units. Um, When you look at those individuals compared to, you know, people who don't have those particular variants and have a a more kind of normalized distribution in the population, you know, their event rate is very, very low. The the likelihood of their kind of lifetime accumulation of plaque is very, very low. Um, We know that they can... Comparatively between those two groups, there's about an 85% reduction in events between those two groups. So although it is, I suppose, technically possible at any particular lipid value level to develop atherosclerosis, the probability of it happening certainly at an early time point um, below those values at less than the fifth percentile um, is exceptionally low. Um, Mm. And so this really comes down to how you think about a risk factor. It's not about going to your doctor and say, listen, do I have high cholesterol or normal cholesterol? It's about where is it on that distribution? And then you have to say, listen, well, what is my risk? Over what time horizon am I trying to manage that risk? And what is my attitude towards that risk? And you will find that that people have very different uh, perspectives on this. I have I have patients who have extensive coronary artery disease because of, uh, say, scanning uh, imaging techniques that have revealed that. Um, but they are just 100% adamant that they will not go on any medications and they want to use only lifestyle factors to decrease their risk. I don't particularly agree with it. Um, I think they're leaving a lot of benefit on the table, but that is their choice. Um, and the counter to that is, is I have younger, younger individuals who will uh, come to my practice and they'll have a, an elevated risk factor, um, but nothing else really kind of driving up their risk, but want to very aggressively manage that risk using all methods available from lifestyle factors and also potentially including medications. And the European Society guidelines are actually really, really clear about this, is that if you're looking at the category of primary prevention, So that is preventing uh, and managing risk factors to prevent the first event. Even high-risk individuals, it is not mandatory that they go on medications. But for low to moderate risk individuals, the the decision to use a medication to manage a risk factor, um, you know, shouldn't be withheld if that is their uh, approach to it. So this is where, again, you know, framing the question is, what is my current baseline risk? 
What is the time horizon I'm interested in? And what is my attitude or how aggressive do I want to be about managing that risk factor? And if you're uh, at low risk and you're thinking, about, you're thinking about your lifetime cardiovascular risk and you want to be very, very aggressive, you want to model that cohort of individuals who have those particular gene mutations that run their ApoB concentrations or LDL particle concentrations at less than the fifth percentile. And by definition, 95% of the population will be above the fifth percentile. Mm. So for most people, they will require aggressive uh, considerations of lifestyle factors and or most of them will require some assistance with medications to get them to target. Mm. The highest risk is, yeah, if you have the high blood pressure, you're smoking high blood sugar and high lipids, and the lowest risk is low lipids, no, blood, no high blood pressure, no diabetes, no smoking and no inflammation and those things. So it's like a scale or a continuum. Yeah, like the lowest risk is all things are low and normal, <laughs> and the highest risk is uh, all things are high and uh, you're smoking and categorized as diabetic. Yeah, and and we we have again very very strong data to support that the, the the risk factors as you add them together don't doesn't increase your risk on a linear basis. So mm -hmm. if you have one risk factor, your your risk goes up considerably. But if you have two risk factors, your risk does not go up on a linear basis. It increases on an exponential basis. Mm, wow. So this is the problem in terms of when you have you know two risk factors, now three risk factors, now four risk factors your risk is ratcheting up uh, on an exponential basis. But it also holds true that if you aggressively manage those risk factors, your risk comes down on a very aggressive scale. Um, and, you know, we know that managing early about, you know, eight to 10 factors, um, most of which we have covered here, at a, a very aggressive fashion throughout your lifetime can delay the onset of coronary artery disease for the absolute majority of people. Clearly, there will be people who have certain gene variants or something will happen within that, that cohort of individuals. So we can never prevent it 100%, but we can seriously tilt the odds in our favor. And if you look at this again, going back to our original discussion, on an actuarial basis, you take the leading cause of death and the condition that is most likely to kill you, um, you know, if you are, say, a, a male in particular, but also females, um, you know, about 35% of adults will die from cardiovascular disease. And you have, you know, these levers that you can pull, you can significantly decrease the risk of developing or dying from early cardiovascular disease. The second thing to point out is, is that when you take these factors and you decrease your risk using them, you delay the onset of other major chronic diseases, specifically as several different types of cancers and also several different variants of neurodegenerative disease, degenerative disease, particularly dementias, Alzheimer's dementia, and vascular dementia. And so really then we're, we're creating this phase shift in terms of the, the timing of the onset of a major chronic disease. And I think as, as most people are aware is that most people are trying to, to model the, the healthy centenarian. But mm. as I always say, in terms of when thinking about the, the healthy centenarian uh, data, the first thing we need to do is not take their advice because <laughs> yeah. the things that they're doing are not the things that are actually driving whether or not they actually lived to be 110 years of age. When we look at people living, you know, from, you know, uh, going from, say, 65 to 85, you can trust what they say. But when we look at the cohort of individuals who are, you know, 110, they likely carry uh, a lot of genetic factors that actually decrease their probability of early chronic diseases. So yeah. genetics, you know, for, for longevity don't matter a huge amount up until you get to 70s or 80s, but from 70s and 80s onwards, they matter a lot. But mm. for most people, this is really a game of not living to 110, or it certainly isn't for me. It's about saying, listen, can I live a, a fairly healthy life, you know, up until kind of my mid to late eighties or maybe into my nineties rather than dying at say 65 or, you know, 70 years of age. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Like the centenarians, a lot of them <laughs> tend to smoke and, uh, you know, have some other un like, or at least they don't have any like exceptional health habits. So yeah, like the genetics has a huge role to reach, you know, the extremes of human lifespan in the first place. Like, even if you follow all the healthy lifestyles, if you don't have the genes, you're not going to live to 115 or something like that. Yeah, I, and I think the, the the literature would say that that's you know unlikely to be the case. But but I think the thing that they teach us though um, is is not that we should model their behaviors, is we should model them as the time course of when they develop diseases. Yeah, their medical. So this history, is this you know? this difference <laughs> between health span and lifespan. If you look at the leading causes of death for non-smokers, they're going to be cardiovascular disease, cancer, and dementia. If you look at the the centenarians, 
they will, for the most part, die from cardiovascular disease, cancer, and dementia, throw in a couple of falls and respiratory tract infections. And this is, is work by Nir Barzilai, I think in Einstein in New York, is that if you look at this phase shift of timing of these major chronic diseases, that they get them about 10 to 25 years later than everybody else. So mm -hmm. they have a genetic coat of armor, so they can kind of do what they like. You know, as you said, they, they tend to smoke just as much as everybody else. They tend not to do a significant amount of exercise. But if we can say, listen, the model here is to delay the onset of disease, the key then has to be treat the, the or manage the aggressive risk factors, uh, manage the risk factors aggressively early to delay the onset of coronary disease. And we actually do have evidence to support that. If you look at people who are, say, passing the threshold of age 50 and they get most of their risk factors correct insofar as they're you know, active on a regular basis, they don't consume excessive alcohol, their lipid values are in check, their blood pressures are at target, they're you know, non-diabetic. And you look at these individuals at age 50. And then you compare them to someone who hasn't got these risk factors in check. There's about a 10 to 14 year difference in terms of the timing of the onset of a major chronic disease. So that's not lifespan. That's actually 10 to 14 years of health span. And now clearly it will ultimately translate into to lifespan as well. But that's the key thing that I think most people need to realize is that if you're getting these things right, crossing age 50, the likelihood of you getting an additional 10 years or so of higher health span metrics, so your functional quality of life being higher, um, is much higher. And the thing that is most likely to impact your quality of life or your health span is whether or not you have a major chronic disease. Mm, gotcha. Um, what about the LPLA? So this is also genetically determined a lot. And yeah, what can we talk so, about that? LP little a is the most commonly inherited genetic cholesterol particle disorder. So when we talk about genetic cholesterol part, when we talk about cholesterol particles, um, uh, basically cholesterol is trans it can, is not soluble in the blood, so it needs an actual way to transport itself around. It, it needs a package. That package has, say, one protein on the outside in particular called the ApoB um, protein. And so one protein per particle. So therefore, you can count the, the amount of ApoB and it gives you, uh, you know, an approximation of the, the number of particles. But we know that in about 10 to 20 percent of the population, uh, individuals carry an additional modification uh, on that particle called uh, an LPA tail or a Kringle repeat tail. Um, that the, the the variance of that is is determined, uh, you know, eighty percent by genetics, um, and so it's either high or it's not high, and so the the distribution is not a normal Gaussian distribution. Um, these individuals have a significantly increased risk of developing atherosclerosis at an early time point in life, um, both coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease aortic stenosis, peripheral arterial disease, they're at higher risk of heart attacks, um, stroke, and heart failure, and early mortality. And this holds true, this incremental risk, even if you have normal, say, lipid values. So this is a type. This is a, you have basically a, a type of abnormal cholesterol, and I will often refer to it as cholesterol plus. So it's just, it's, it's, it's the studies have looked at this is, is that there are on a particle for particle basis, LPA particles are about six times more atherogenic or disease causing compared to a standard particle. Hmm. The big challenge with this is because it is genetically determined, your, your, the lifestyle factors that you deploy don't significantly influence the concentration of your LP little a. Additionally, there are no specific approved therapies for lowering LP little a, but that's likely to change in the very near future. But just because you cannot lower specifically LP little a does not mean that you cannot lower risk because risk, as we talked about, is a function of all of your risk factors together. So if you take someone who's got an elevated LP little a, but if you add in smoking, physical activity, inactivity, diabetes, hypertension, all these other factors, that significantly ratchets up your risk. But if you get all the other factors right, even in the context of an elevated LP little a, you can significantly decrease your risk. So the goal for, for patients with an elevated LP little a is, number one, find out if you do have it, and you know 10 to 20% of the population have an elevated LP little a, so you know loads of people who have it, they just probably don't know that they have it. Number two, if you do have an elevated LP little a, you have to over-rotate and be very aggressive about all your traditional risk factors in order to get you to the time point that we hopefully will have a therapy to specifically lower LP little a. And we know we have therapies that can reduce it by about 80 to 90%, but they are currently in phase three trials assessing whether you can actually reduce events 
in that high risk group. So in the interim, pull every lever as hard as you can across traditional risk factors. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The LPLLA is, if I'm not mistaken, then you can like, you, you can, you can measure it at your doctor with regular blood work. And, uh, you, you, at least you, you should do it at least once in your life to see where your like genetic range uh, is at. Correct. Now, the challenge with measuring LP little a is that historically it has not been measured. Um, mm. And that is true of both primary care practice and cardiology. So it's not that all the cardiologists were assessing LP little a. Um, uh, the reality is, is most people have not had their LP little a measured. Um, if you do your standard cholesterol panel, it is not part of a standard cholesterol panel. And you can have a completely normal, quote unquote, LDL cholesterol and have an elevated LP little a. It is a specific test that you do. Um, Sometimes it has to be done in a hospital-based lab. Uh, sometimes you have to use other different services um, to, to assess it. But even if someone is willing to assess it, the pushback that patients will often get is that, what's the point in checking it? Because, you know, we can't reduce it. So what's the point? Number one, I would say to that is that maybe, just maybe, someone might actually want to know where their genetic risk actually comes from and whether it's a factor for them. Uh, number two, it might be the key determining factor for them to change their position on whether they may go on, say, lipid-lowering therapy, if, if necessary, whether to aggressively uh, think about kind of moving from just lifestyles to medications for, for blood pressure control. It is the factor that may have them take exercise more seriously or, or, or basically weight loss more seriously. Um, and also the decision as to whether they would undergo more advanced testing for assessment of early coronary artery disease in terms of positioning them themselves and understanding risk. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. What I've what I've seen from my own blood work is that my LPLA is generally like low. It, it was like 3.4 milligrams per deciliter last November. And, and then I did it in July again and it dropped slightly to 2.4. Uh, so that, as I understand, that's like very low, <laughs> but uh, how much can you then lower it with lifestyle? Like I've, on, I've only just, you know, I've, I didn't take so, any yeah. pharmaceuticals or anything. Yeah, so there there will be some variance uh, that you will see and even when any with any particular uh, blood draw. Um, but the degree of variance uh, that we're seeing, say if you if you look at certain therapies like PCSK9 inhibitors or uh, more novel um, lipid lowering therapies like Inclisiram, for example, so they're they're exclusively designed for lowering ApoB particles. They will reduce uh, LP little a concentrations by about twenty to thirty percent. Mm -hmm. Now, will that 20 to 30 percent reduction translate into a reduction in risk of events? There is some suggestions when you do subgroup analysis uh, in terms of these trials, but but they were not pre-specified endpoints in terms of the actual trials. And really, I think when we we look at the the trial data, you probably need a substantial reduction in LP little a to really manifest a reduction in risk of event over, say, a three to five year time horizon in the order of eighty to ninety percent. And that is the, the the magnitude of LP little a lowering that we have seen with the the I think really impressive pipeline of therapies. Uh, the antisense oligonucleotide therapies and a host of other therapies um, in terms of small interfering RNAs, et cetera. Um, so in terms of an area that has significant promise, um, this is one of those areas. Gotcha. Um, and you mentioned this lipid particle concept, which we didn't touch upon uh, earlier, but I think that's also like important for people to kind of get clarity in the cholesterol and lipid, lipid uh, concepts when it comes to heart disease. So, uh, it's the lipid particles, the, the number of lipid particles that drives the atherosclerosis. And the cholesterol isn't necessarily like the particle itself. The cholesterol is like inside the lipids, uh, the lipid particles, right? Correct. And so th this is this is a function of really what drives the risk. And if you if you look at the studies in this, is the, is the number of cholesterol particles not mm -hmm. necessarily the actual concentration of the cholesterol, which would be typically approximated uh, by your LDL cholesterol. Now, if you look historically in populations of people who are insulin sensitive, you can see on a percentile basis where, say, someone sits from their ApoB percentile basis, if you measure their LDL cholesterol or their non-HDL cholesterol, um, they roughly match up. 
Um, so you have what's called concordance. So if you measure someone's LDL cholesterol, they might be at the 50th percentile. So will their non-HDL uh, uh, you know, cholesterol. So will their ApoB particle concentration. The problem is, is that when you introduce insulin resistance, prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, et cetera, that rule of thumb or that concordance and that linear relationship starts to break down considerably. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you can have individuals who will say have a, you know, normal or moderately elevated LDL cholesterol, but their actual particle count as measured by their ApoB may be substantially more. So that person is being exposed to a much, much higher risk um, than they actually may have thought. Now, mm -hmm. to be fair, um, a lot of people have difficulties getting access to ApoB testing which is why measuring your non-HDL, which is your total cholesterol discounted by your HDL, gives a fairly good approximation um, of your ApoB particle count. Um, and so you can, you can get a very good approximation. And so really what's driving that difference often is your triglycerides. You'll see someone who's got a relatively normal, say, LDL cholesterol, but their triglycerides may be elevated. Um, so that means their particle count is, is elevated. Um, but this is where if you look at individuals and you look at outcomes in terms of people who have either high ApoB or high LDL cholesterol, or you look at kind of variants of this, the risk tracks with the high ApoB, not necessarily the high LDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And for, for people who really want to dial this risk approximation in really carefully, managing and measuring ApoB is, is probably the, the best way of doing it. However, Managing it on the basis of, say, your non-HDL cholesterol is also a very, very good way to do it. So just right. because you can't get your hands on an ApoB concentration um, doesn't necessarily exclude kind of the, the ability to do that. Mm. Yeah. So if you have high LDL and you're also not like, you know, diabetic, then it's very likely that your ApoB is also very high. Exactly. So so like if if you look at individuals who are are very, very insulin sensitive who, you know, have low fasting insulin levels, low fasting glucose, um, and you measure their, their ApoB concentrations and their, their LDL cholesterol concentrations. Most of the time for those individuals, they approximate on a percentile basis. Um, okay. it's in the individuals who have prediabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome, where you start to see significant discordance. And often where this can become an issue is, is that if you're aggressively treating people, um, down to very low levels, Sometimes you can be misled to think that someone is down to target, we'll say at a, an LDL concentration at less than 1.4 or less than 55, um, when in fact their, their ApoB concentration is actually higher that, than that on a percentile basis, and maybe they need more aggressive treatment. Mm, gotcha. Uh, does the particle size also matter? So like small dense and high dense particles? So, it, so what matters most in this is the particle uh, number. Um, right. the, the, the issue here is that the particle size in terms of the, the size of the, uh, uh, cholesterol particle is largely determined by, again, whether you're insulin resistant or not. Mm. So, you know, small dense par particles matter. They matter because a, you have likely more particles and B, you have likely insulin resistance, just like we talked about at the very start. Now you have high ApoB particles in the context of insulin resistance and your risk compared to low, low on both of these has gone up 11 fold. So. You know, it's because of it's because the the small dense particles are in effect a proxy marker for uh, for insulin resistance. Gotcha. Another another thing I feel like we is like a mandatory question is like HDL is the good cholesterol and and uh, does high HDL like you know reduce the risk of heart disease and reduce the accumulation of atherosclerosis? The 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 only um. The only use for HDL cholesterol, in my view, at this current time is to discount it from your total cholesterol to assess your non-HDL. Mm. Um, the, the idea of someone having a high HDL cholesterol, so that is protective, um, th that, that really is, is, is technically not true. Um, where, where we see this, to be fair, is that people who have a high HDL cholesterol and low triglyceride concentration tend to be insulin sensitive. So you're in that category who you, you might have a high LDL cholesterol and a high lipid particle count, but you're likely to be insulin sensitive. So therefore, you got that 80% increased in risk rather than the 11-fold increase right. in risk. So it's yeah. not necessarily that the, the you know, it, it, if you look at HDL concentrations, 
they don't really map on to the thing that we're really interested in. And, and that is basically the efflux capacity. So it's the actual functional capacity of the HDL uh, particle. Um, and so so therefore, I, I the only purpose I have of measuring HDL uh, is to discount it from the total cholesterol to calculate the non-HDL. Mm. Yeah, and like specifically raising HDL doesn't reduce the heart disease events either. So the, the answer to that is so far, uh, that is correct. Um, uh, we looked at the CTEP inhibitors and we know that pharmacologically increasing HDL either made no difference to cardiovascular events or actually made things worse. Um, there is some trials ongoing that may actually change that. Um, I think it's called the ROSE trial, and I'm going to mispronounce this as obitcetratib. Um, I've definitely mispronounced that, so check it on the internet, folks. Um, but that is something that is a, a trial that is currently ongoing and may change that particular parameter, but it's a it's a watch this space uh, trial. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, one marker that I'm also curious to ask about is a homocysteine. So, uh, is more of yeah involved in the endothelial damage and like vascular damage. So how big of a risk factor is high homocysteine? So homocysteine is something that I I don't track that frequently, um, and I wouldn't uh, say that I'm an expert by any means. Um, by all accounts, the literature would say that elevated homocysteine levels are are certainly related to higher levels of inflammation and increased cardiovascular risk. But where the challenge comes into uh, this equation is is that in lowering homocysteine levels, typically with vitamin uh, B complex uh, supplementation, the, the the literature there in terms of reducing risk is is very very modest. Mm. So it's there's there's definitely a relationship in terms of increased cardiovascular risk, but how we reduce that risk, I think that the the literature is mixed in terms of reductions in events. Um, we know that inflammation uh, as a component of cardiovascular risk is absolutely crucial. We know that it is important in terms of damage to the LDL particle, damage to the actual endothelial lining, increasing the probability of um, transition of the particle across the wall, increasing the likelihood of particle retention, etc. cetera. Um, but inflammation manifests in multiple different axes. And so when you look at the studies that actually have reduced inflammation, and we're particularly talking about here about reducing high sensitivity CRP, um, the original trials uh, using rosuvastatin reduced high sensitivity CRP, but also reduced LDL cholesterol and event rates reduced. But the problem was with that particular trial was, was it the LDL cholesterol or was it the high, sen high sensitivity CRP reductions and reductions in inflammation that reduced the risk? When you look at a subsequent trial, then can you kinemab that actually looked at this? Um, an, an interleukin-based therapy, it had no effect on lipid particle concentrations, but reduced CRP and also reduced cardiovascular events modestly. So reducing uh, inflammation to reduce risk is something that is borne out as a, as a clear um, therapeutic strategy. The problem is, is how you reduce inflammation in which pathway actually makes a big difference. Because if you look at a subsequent trial using methotrexate to reduce levels of inflammation, that particular trial was negative and there was no reduction in event rates. Um, and so then you move on to colchicine, for example. So colchicine, a, a classic anti-inflammatory typically used for the management of pericarditis. Um, that has very strong data in terms of reducing inflammation and reducing cardiovascular risk and events uh, that go with it. So what I would say is, is that inflammation is a key part of the process of atherosclerosis, but there's many different types of inflammation and different pathways of inflammation. And it's the, the specific pathway reduction that probably makes the, the biggest difference. Um, but we know things like maintaining insulin sensitivity, maintaining your weight at target, uh, regular exercise, these are things that significantly reduce levels of, of inflammation. So, uh, that, that's how I tend to, to look at it. Um, you know, right or wrong, I, I don't focus a huge amount on homocysteine, um, mm. but, you know, I'm, I'm happy to uh, be told otherwise and uh, see a, a really kind of positive randomized trial uh, that, that kind of very clearly shows reductions in events. This kind of leads me to one topic as well, which is uh, exercise. You know, I think it's <laughs> not uh, worth to talk a lot about like that exercise reduces the risk of uh, heart disease and reduce, r lowers the risk factors as well. The topic I want to talk about is the kind of this association between long term like chronic exercise and this uh, higher burden of atherosclerosis in uh, these um, master athletes. I don't know if you've uh, seen those studies, but uh, 
what do you think is happening there? Is it some sort of like chronic inflammation with the exercise that promotes this uh, atherosclerosis or is there something else? <laughs> yeah. And so again, uh, it's important to to put this on the the distribution of the amount of exercise that people are doing and then looking at the category that we're actually thinking about. So, you know, I've had some patients say to me um, in clinic, say, listen, I'm afraid to do kind of a bit more exercise because, you know, master level athletes develop coronary artery disease. But if you look at the volume that the of exercise that these people are doing, it's astronomical. It's, it's mm. huge amounts of volume of exercise. So the probability that you fall into this category, unless you're a Norwegian cross-country skier for their Olympic team, um, is just exceptionally low. So, so this is this is really not an issue for a large percentage of the population. It's really, really kind of a niche, small category. But mm. the the evidence is the evidence. And if you look at people who do very significant volumes of aerobic exercise and endurance activities, and as I referred to, a lot of this literature comes from Norwegian cross-country skiers or elite endurance athletes. In terms of their biggest risk that actually comes with this is increases in atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is a, an abnormal heart rhythm disorder. So in, in truth, they, they do have higher rates of, of calcification compared to age match peers, which is, is surprising. But the thing that actually causes them more problems is atrial fibrillation. That's mm for a different day, but but actually probably the condition that causes them more problems. Gotcha. When you look at the, the accelerations in calcification, um, they are real. Um, and we have, you know, looked at this in terms of various different long-term studies, and they tend to, uh, they, they, there's, there's a higher frequency of uh, uh, coronary artery calcification. What you see though with these individuals is, is that they tend to have less events. So mm. even though they have a significant amount of plaque, their event rate is actually much less. So the supposed, I suppose, etiology to this or driving factor is basically very high levels of shear stress. So very kind of high physiological strain over very long periods of time um, that, that is causing basically erosion of the endothelial surface um, that can potentially be a driver for atherosclerosis. That is one of the hypotheses that is actually the... The, the driver of atherosclerosis in terms of endothelial lining damage, but but they tend to develop lots of calcification and macro calcification, which is very, very stable plaque and less likely to rupture. Mm. Additionally, if you look at the literature that you referred to, as you have increasing levels of aerobic fitness, the higher the level of aerobic fitness as characterized by VO2 max, the, the monotonic reduction that you see in all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease. So, you know, taking out the, the calcification scores, they just have, as a category, very low uh, rates of all-cause mortality compared to, to those who are kind of in a low fitness category and also cardiovascular disease. The second thing is to say that when you look at a lot of these studies, they, they describe a J-shaped pattern. So you see the, the second kind of highest level of fitness has a very low level of of risk and then you see basically this j curve this kind of this tick up at the very end in terms of so these people have an increased risk but it's an increased risk compared to the group that were measured just before them so they still have a very 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 low risk and additionally when you look at these studies and you look at the confidence intervals so the error bars on these um these studies, because the numbers are going to be so small in these uh, very, very elite groups, the confidence intervals are often very large. So therefore, if you were just comparing against the group before, we often don't have enough statistical power um, to actually describe that difference. Um, and so in general, I tend not to worry about this as a problem. Mm. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it, it really is only a, f a factor potentially for a very small percentage of the population who are doing, you know, exceptionally high rates, uh, high volumes of exercise. Yeah, if you think you're like an athlete, then you would have to actually, you know, train several hours every day. Every day. Yeah, <laughs> which most people aren't doing. And yeah, like, even then, like you said, you know, exercise is so good that even if it increases calcification at the elite level, it still reduces the total risk <laughs> or the total exactly. uh, event rate. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the, the key here is, I think, you know, 
anyone who's in, interested in this space is, you know, has been exposed to the statistics around the highest levels of VO2 max and the top 2.5% on a kind of hazard ratio basis have, say, a five-fold difference in terms of all-cause mortality, uh, mm. comparing the top 2.5% versus the bottom 25%. So everyone hears this. And I, in my experience, I think that's it's an interesting data point. Um, but it stresses an awful lot of people out because they go, well, I'm not in the top 2.5% of kind of VO2 max categories. But really, if you were looking to really optimize your returns, the biggest returns come from getting off zero. Mm. And so it's it's really, you know, there's there's diminishing returns as you get in terms of up the scales of higher levels of aerobic fitness. So what I would look at this is say, listen, like if you're if you're moderately aerobically fit, that's probably good enough. And you're going to get most of the bang for buck. If you look at people who do weekend exercise versus kind of weekday exercise on a regular basis, matched minute for minute uh, in terms of volumes of exercise, those people get most of the bang for buck. And mm. all of us are time poor. All of us are constrained in terms of kind of how we're going to deploy our resources, which is our most precious resource, which is time. Um, and so what I would say is, is that, listen, if, if health and fitness is, uh, you know, are important to you and you can deploy all the kind of time and effort into it, great. Aim for the top 2.5%, you know, knock yourself out. But if you really just going, want to do what is sensible and really make a, a big dent in your risk from cardiovascular disease and all-cause risk, a moderate amount of activity, getting off zero, uh, kind of a reasonable amount of fitness will get you an awful long way. Yeah, you don't have to be a perfect and not an athlete. Um, but yeah, maybe we can give now some like practical steps for prevention. Of course, we not we don't have to go through the obvious list of uh, don't smoke and don't uh, become overweight and those things. But what are like you know the every everyday things that most people can do to reduce the risk of or you know delay so like when we're talking about yeah delaying the build up of the plaque in the first place so uh exercise diet uh, any supplements or anything like that so it's it's predominantly going to be around your your lifestyle factors so number one have you got a reasonable degree of aerobic fitness so you know in terms of are you doing a reasonable amount of, of exercise in terms of what that is you know ideally reasonably high volumes of lower intensity exercise. And if you can, and you have the physical fitness, a small percentage of speed work to actually kind of uh, improve those parameters as well. So building out that aerobic base in terms of kind of your lower volume exercise. And the more you do that, the better, you know, we use 150 minutes per week, but that's a minimum. And it's pretty easy to hit when you include all the activities that count that up. Some speed work, um, and then uh, adding in ideally kind of two or more uh, resistance or strength or resistance training sessions. Um, you couple those things together and you're really building up your aerobic base, your insulin sensitivity that will come with that, your muscle power, muscle strength, muscle mass. They are the things that kind of form the core base of this. Um, in terms of uh, insulin sensitivity, along with those exercise patterns, have you basically got to your target weight so you don't have excess visceral fat that's driving the metabolic consequence of insulin resistance? Um, for most people, that's basically you know, having a normal waist circumference or roughly did you have, you know, can you fit into your genes that when you were in your kind of your twenties and kind of, and early thirties or something like that, that frustrates a lot of people, but it's, it's, it's a rough uh, approximation. If you want to get more precise, you can measure visceral fat levels uh, on a DEXA scan and look at it on a, on a, on an age match peer basis. But, but roughly the question is, is do you have any any features of metabolic dysfunction because of excess weight? Do you have high mm. triglycerides? Do you have low HDL? Do you have uh, increased uh, blood pressure? Um, do you have abnormal glucose levels? You know, do you have an abnormal or increased waist circumference? Um, so they're, they're all kind of features of the metabolic syndrome. Do you have an elevated fasting insulin levels or an abnormal HOMA IOR score, which integrates both insulin and glucose together? Um, so that is that, that exercise and nutrition piece. Um, that, that that really formed the, the framework for that. The other kind of big key factors here are, are you getting adequate sleep? Um, I think the, the the key issue with sleep here is, is shortened sleep is associated with worse cardiovascular events. But I think the big driver to that is because people with poor sleep are less likely to do the first two things that we were actually talking about. Um, uh, and then in terms of your, your cognitive well-being, you know, um, have you got that in check in terms of so that you have the headspace to do the things like get good sleep, Focus on exercise, focus on nutrition. You know, as you said, make sure that you're not smoking, 
check your blood pressure to make sure that you actually are in the normal blood pressure range. We do a terrible job of assessing high blood pressure. 50% of US adults have high blood pressure. Half of blood pressure is undiagnosed. 50% of that blood pressure is uh, not treated. And the other 50% that is treated is suboptimally treated. Um, do you have an elevated LP little a? Do a standard cholesterol panel. Where are you on that risk distribution curve? Um, and these, these are the, the key things that if you're getting those right, you know, you have insulin sensitivity, you have fairly low uh, lipid particle counts, you're relatively active and a relatively kind of uh, moderate levels of aerobic fitness, and you're doing resistance training, not smoking and having normal blood pressure, modest amounts of alcohol, you know, you, you're, you're, you're 90% of the way there. Gotcha. And then it's uh, <laughs> genetics, or what, what else is like the final determinant? Well, yeah. And so where this, you know, the, 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 the statement that I use to my patients is, is about understanding your risk factor profile, but also trying to see basically whether there are measured or unmeasured variants or va variables in terms of your risk that have translated into early plaque buildup. So mm. you can have ostensibly everything right, but you can actually develop early plaque buildup. Now, it is way less likely to be the case, but it is a possibility for a small number of patients. And this is particularly the case when you have, say, a strong early family history of heart disease, and maybe it's a rare gene variant that's actually driving that risk. Mm. This is where we think about kind of looking not at risk factors, but actually the presence or absence of the disease. And this is where we start thinking about imaging tests like a cardiac CT and say calcium scoring or CT coronary angiography to define whether or not you actually have plaque accumulation. Um, mm. And so, so that, that's, that's moving into a totally different category. And I think that is a, an important distinction in terms of understanding your risk, more so when you get to, to midlife, because a, a cardiac CT is almost certainly going to be normal for younger individuals. We're talking people in their 20s and 30s, unless they have a very, very strong early family history of heart disease. Um, so really in, in you know, your kind of up to age kind of 30s and you probably kind of like up to age 40 or so, it's really about controlling those risk factor profile features that we talked about. Then we start to to update kind of the, the imaging kind of question for, for, for okay. males and females probably on a bit of a stage basis to see whether or not there's a presence of plaque there or not. Mm. Yeah, because, you know, one thing is the risk factors and the other is the actual disease. So uh, you can you can have the risk factors but not develop the actual plaque buildup and vice versa, you can have no risk factors and still have the plaque. <laughs> so the plaque buildup is actually the only thing that matters in the context of risk of events. It, it, uh -huh. true, that is true, but we also have to think about, remember we said, what is your risk? What is the time horizon over which you're, mm. you're assessing that risk? And so mm -hmm. if you are, say, a 35-year-old male with significant risk factors and we do a cardiac CT and you have a calcium score of zero, what that says is that you have a low near-term risk of an event, but your lifetime cardiovascular risk is still substantially elevated. Right, compared right. to someone uh, who isn't. And so if your uh, objective is to reduce lifetime cardiovascular risk, it doesn't matter that you have a normal cardiac CT. What matters yeah. is that we optimize your risk factors. Gotcha. But what if someone has, you know, elevated uh, calcium in the arteries? Is it all like, yeah, how bad is it? <laughs> and um, when should, uh, when does it, or at like what point is the risk of a heart attack uh, going to be exponentially high? Because the CT scan the scale goes from, you know, zero to several thousand. Correct. And so, I mean, I have lots of patients with calcium scores of zero in my practice, and I have some patients with calcium scores of over 6,000. Mm. Um, so basically, the, the the key here is that, you know, a calcium score of zero means your risk of a, a, of a heart attack or stroke over a 10-year time frame is, is well less than 2%. Um, if it goes, a calcium score goes greater than 100, your risk has jumped up quite substantially. Um, you know, above 400, you probably have the same risk of an event as someone who's had a prior heart attack. And obviously kind of above a thousand, your risk is significantly increased. The key thing for younger individuals who get a cardiac CT is that even if they have a, say a calcium score of five, for example, which is a very small amount of plaque and really does mean that their risk of a near-term event is pretty modest. The problem is, is that on a percentile basis, they may be at a very high percentile for an age match peer. So mm. if you are a 45-year-old female with a calcium score of five, although it's a small amount of plaque, it's significantly more than we would expect for an age match peer. So we always need to see the scores between one and 100 or even above 100 on a, on a percentile basis as well. And that's something we can work out. Gotcha. So the younger you are, the worse it is to have higher plaque, higher CT score.
Well, correct, because you remember we talked about it at the very start. Everyone starts off with no plaque and eventually mm. develops plaque. But if you kicked off that process much, much earlier compared to kind of an age match peer, you, that, that that boat has already sailed for you. And, you you know, you've, you've, you've started that advanced plaque accumulation earlier in okay. life. Mm. But then it's uh, also like a matter of progression so that you someone in their 40s might see that, OK, I have whatever, 15 a CT score, but they could stop it or kind of halt it for the next few decades where Correct. someone who has zero at 45 but they keep going one one score higher every year then by the time they're 70 they'll have like 30 or something so it's a matter of progression as well then yeah and and that's and that is that is again back to control of our risk factors so mm. when someone actually has a you know evidence of advanced plaque and abnormal calcium score um we know that to an extent we can reverse or regress coronary atherosclerosis we can't make it go away we can't make your calcium score go lower but what we do know is that we can uh, change the composition of that plaque to make it a much more stable plaque and a much more calcified plaque and minimize the burden of what's called non-calcified plaque. When you do that, the actual plaque volume size decreases. Um, you're less likely to have progression of plaque. You get a small amount of regression. You get plaque stabilization. And the, the evidence would say in totality that there's probably a significant reduction in events with that. Uh, and the way that we do that is, is hitting the targets that we talked about. We know that regular exercise, even after after you've had a heart attack, significantly reduces uh, events, and it also does so by causing plaque regression. We know that um, getting ApoB particle concentrations or LDL concentrations down to less than 1.4 or less than 55 is strongly associated with plaque regression. Um, we know that certain dietary patterns, and what I would argue is, is pretty much any dietary pattern that actually maintains your, your insulin sensitivity. Um, the DISCO trial, which looked at a, a DASH-based diet, didn't actually cause plaque regression, but caused a significant plaque recomposition largely. So it basically you know, had more calcified plaque and a decrease in non-calcified plaque. So again, it's going back as always to those core risk factors that we talked about and pulling those levers. And for people who have documented atherosclerosis and their goal is reversal or regression of atherosclerosis, we just need to be pulling those levers additionally harder. Right. So more aggressive approach with the risk factors, getting getting the lipids lower and blood sugar lower and uh, blood pressure more normal. Correct. Mm, gotcha. Um, what about the soft plaque? So uh, this is something that you, as I understand, you can't detect from the CT scan, but so that can give you like a false sense of security that you have zero on this calcium scan, but you might still have this uh, soft plaque. So it depends on when we talk about a cardiac CT, that really uh, is an umbrella term for two scans. One is a calcium score, which looks only for calcified plaque. But we know that in about 5 to 10 percent, 5 to 10 percent of patients, if you do more advanced testing, i.e. a CT coronary angiogram, you can actually detect a very small percentage of those patients will have some calcified plaque that was not detected on the first scan. And the remaining uh, patients will actually have some non-calcified plaque. So when people say soft plaque, with the technical term that we use is non-calcified plaque, but that can be seen on a CT coronary angiogram. And, you know, I have a handful of patients who have a calcium score of zero and have had obstructive uh, coronary artery disease as a function of non-calcified plaque requiring intervention. So it's it's not very common, but it's something uh, we see not infrequently. And again, when you you can have a calcium score of zero, but about five to ten percent of patients um, in, in middle uh, age will have some evidence of uh, plaque on more advanced testing. Mm, gotcha. Is is there a way to? Yeah, like so. You you can't like reverse the, I guess like a calcified plaque, but you can uh, make it more stable. The soft, the non-calcified, you can make it more calcified, which Correct. is so, which is which a better it's... better alternative than the higher non-calcified. Yeah, so you're basically converting that non-calcified plaque to calcified plaque. And so when we think about the highest risk kind of uh, features of a, of a plaque, often you get what's called microcalcification. So this kind of like spotty calcification, that is a, a high risk feature for plaque. And we, we know that from a variety of different studies. But when you look at extensive calcification, you get a thing called macrocalcification. And there are larger sheets of calcification that make a plaque much more stable, but less likely to rupture. And that's probably what we're seeing in, in the elite athlete population. Okay. Is there like a number that, so, or is it like, okay, you have a calcium score of whatever, 100, 
how, does it still are, are you still able to or <laughs> will you be able to uh, at a higher risk of a heart attack or is it like only you get a heart attack after a certain limit of, no like, no it doesn't work like that um right. so calcification scores quantify the amount of plaque and there is a linear relationship in terms of more plaque equals more risk mm -hmm. but you can have calcium scores of several thousand have non-obstructive coronary artery disease, have no symptoms, have that plaque be stable throughout your entire life and die at a very er very late stage in life with all that calcified plaque, but never have an event. Okay, right. And uh, vice versa, you can get a heart attack with a relatively small CT score. With a calcium score of zero. Okay, <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I think that kind of... I don't know if it's like a grim point to start wrapping up, but uh, what 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 would be uh, yeah like uh, if you have a calcium score of zero, how do you not get the heart attack then? It's it's right back to the very first principles that we talked about. The mm -hmm. bottom line is is everyone is going to develop plaque at some point. The key is developing it as late as possible. The way that you develop it as late as possible is by pulling the levers of risk reduction that we've talked about: not smoking, physical activity, insulin sensitivity assessing whether you've got an abnormal LP little a, maintaining normal blood pressure, um, measuring and kind of improving those metrics of aerobic performance and uh, muscle mass, muscle strength, etc. It's about looking at those individual factors and pulling the levers as hard as possible um, and understanding that you will eventually develop plaque, but hopefully mm. you die with a small amount of it rather than from it. Yeah, and the goal is to get it as late as possible. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, that's a better, <laughs> better uh, point to end with. Um, before I ask my last question, uh, where can people learn more about you and your work? So uh, pretty simple. I'm fairly active on socials. Uh, if you put in Dr. Paddy Barrett into Twitter or Instagram, um, I do some videos over there. I do a weekly newsletter. Um, so if you put in Dr. Paddy Barrett Substack, um, uh, I have a newsletter that goes out to about 25,000 people or more uh, every Saturday morning. Um, it's free. So uh, you can just uh, head on over there and uh, sign up. And that covers all the topics that we've been kind of talking about today and some other uh, other stuff that I talk about from time to time. Awesome. We'll put the links in the show notes. And my last question is, what's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Realizing that life is short, um, that over a long enough time horizon, all survival drops to zero. So no matter what you do, lifespan and health span will eventually fall away. But how you spend that time is hands down, bar none, the most important thing. So lifespan and health span are important, but it's what you do at that time that matters the most. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. That's a great, great kind of quote uh, to end with. And yeah, thank you for coming to the show. I, th I found it was very insightful and I think many people will learn a lot uh, from this episode. So thank you. You're very welcome. All right, that's it for this episode. Make sure you check out my new book, The Longevity Leap on Amazon. I'd also appreciate if you share this episode with a friend or family member. Other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.